right. Well, everyone, I would like to welcome you to this amazing virtual event today to celebrate Upside Down Magic. My name is Ginny. I work for Anderson's Bookshops. I'm one of the event coordinators there, and um, we are so happy to be hosting this amazing panel today. Um, I know lots of you are starting school soon or have started school, and you're used to these Zoom calls and staring at your screen, but we like to bring something a little bit different um, than, you know, a teacher talking at you, but this is going to be a really fun, um, was unique conversation between three very special people. So I'd like to introduce Sarah Milnowski, who is uh, the author of Upside Down Magic, which has been um, a long-running series. I think you're on, going on five years now, if I'm correct. Yes, co-author of Upside and Magic. I'll just yes. say I write it with Emily Jenkins and Laura Markle. And yes, the seventh book in the series just came out. Yes. So those of you who ordered a book ticket on the Event Combo website, you will be getting that book from, uh, from us shortly. So welcome, Sarah. We're glad to have you. And today, um, we have a special treat because um, not only do we have the author of the book, but we have um, Lauren Kisilevsky who is um, a VP of Original Movies at Disney, which we'll talk about why that's relevant in just a little bit here. And uh, Josh Kagan, who is a screenwriter of um, Upside Down Magic, as well as, as other, other films. So um, these three folks are going to have a fantastic conversation about Upside Down Magic and all things book to screen, etc. cetera. Um, just want to remind everybody, um, your video and your audio is off. And we'd like to keep it that way, please, just to keep it a little less distracting and keep everybody safe. So if you have a question, please, please, please use the chat. I know several of you already are. That's great. Type in your question as you think of it. And then after the authors have a chat um, and the creators here, will go through and ask your questions um, of the authors for you. So um, if you have any questions of anything about the event or anything, feel free to put that in there as well. And um, otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to this team and you guys can take it away. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yay. I want to thank you guys so much for hosting us, Anderson. This is amazing. We're so happy to be here to support an independent bookstore in Naperville, one of our favorites. I was actually supposed to be doing a big book festival with Anderson in May, and we bumped it a few times. So hopefully I'll get to meet some of you guys in person as soon as we're allowed to have book festivals again. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here with these amazing people to talk to. This is so fun and different. So hi, Lauren. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so we already kind of introduced ourselves a little bit here. Do we, is there anything else you want to add? I'll say that I, so I've written 40 different books. I write, I wrote for adults starting off. Then I went to writing for teens. And now I mostly write for middle grade for tweens. I'm the author of the Whatever After series. And there are about 100,000 books in that series. Okay, not really. But there's 15 books in that series. Uh, and I also write Upside Down Magic with Lauren Markle and Emily Jenkins. Lauren, is there anything else you want to add about your from your intro? Uh, sure. Well, um, hi, everybody. I'm Lauren. I uh, oversee movies at Disney Channel. Um, I've been at the company for about 10 years. Uh, I've worked on a lot of different movies for kids and tweens, many of them with Josh. Um, I've known Sarah since we were 12, I think, <laughs> when we met, even, even younger. Um, so yeah, this is just... Great. I think we actually met in fifth grade in choir, but that's a whole other story. And have been friends for such a long time and, you know, grew up writing together. And so it's just been an extra special treat to get to work on this property in particular, but, um, but it's always meant to get to make movies. It's true. And you should know that Lauren and I and our friend Jess Braun were yearbook editors together of our high school and I <laughs> found it and brought it. Um, and while I won't make you guys listen to the entire yearbook because it is a little bit ridiculous. Oh no, go for it. Our editor's page, okay? And there is a picture of us with our friend Jess back when we were, what, 16? 16, 16, 16, 17? Yes, we grew up in Montreal, Canada, and there is our yearbook. Okay, Josh, what about you? How do you, how do you fit into this threesome here? Uh <laughs> I did not go to high school with Lauren and Sarah. Yeah, that's a better word, huh? Um, uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Josh Kagan. I uh, am a screenwriter uh, for the last three years now, but three or four years. I've been pretty exclusively working for Disney. And before that, I have written such movies as uh, Band Slam, uh, which nobody saw, uh, The Duff, <laughs> which more people saw, and uh, then uh, the Kim Possible movie for Disney, and uh, Upside Down Magic, as well as the just announced uh, Spin, which is miraculously about to start shooting. 
Really? Where? <laughs> we, Iceland is that? the one place that, that there's. Uh, Canada, I think. Am I allowed to say that? Oh, it was in the trades. I feel like I'm allowed to say that. Uh, and uh, I haven't written 40 books, and mostly I just sit on the couch and watch the uh, Pluto Mystery Science Theater channel. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay, I thought we could each tell the audience a little bit about how we got to where we are, because we have all done, you know, lots in our industries. Maybe someone else start. Josh, do you want to start about how, like, how you became a screenwriter? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I did it to avoid doing homework. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, I was and managed to be a really terrible student throughout my entire public school career because uh, I'm, uh, I'm not great with numbers and things that look like numbers, uh, but, uh, and I also have terrible handwriting. So in my mother's office, there was a TRS-80, uh, ask your grandparents what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a computer about the size of a Yugo, and I got permission from my teachers to write my homework when I actually felt like doing homework out uh, on the computer and print it up because my handwriting, as I said, was terrible. I very quickly realized that typing sounds like typing, whether you're typing homework or not homework, because my mom would come to the door of the office, listen for typing to see that I was doing my work. Uh, and uh, I, I started writing like short stories and sketches and plays and stuff. Uh, and then from that, I, I won a couple of statewide playwriting competitions and kind of realized like, oh, this is like the thing that I guess I'm quote unquote good at. I should probably focus on this. Uh, and then from there, I studied uh, writing in college and, uh, and then got my first gig out of grad school at MTV Animation. Uh, back when MTV had programs. Uh, and, and then I've just sort of been chugging along ever since. Uh, and that's my story. That's awesome. Lauren, what about you? Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, tell us your story. <laughs> yeah, come on. Well, I grew up in Montreal with Sarah Woo! and her other, <laughs> and her other friend Jess and a bunch of other friends. Um, and uh, I always loved reading. I was, uh, you know, just that was always my favorite thing to do. And I read always popular books. I remember my parents used to want me to read fancy books, but I would love series, much like the kinds of series that Sarah writes. Um, and uh, also loved to write. You know, I was in creative writing with Sarah and I loved, I was in uh, school plays and in musicals. I was terrible, but I loved it. Uh, and so it was, I always knew I wanted to uh, be in communications in some way, shape, or form. And in college, I worked uh, in radio and uh, just explored a couple different. I had worked for the school paper and tried on a, a number. Were of you a things. DJ? I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I, I was no, I was not a DJ. I did every other. I worked in reception. I worked in promotions. I worked in ads. I drove around the little car that said like, "Come to the corner of so and so and get the free whatever." <laughs> um, and and. Uh, and I gave away a lot of movie passes. Um, and then when I graduated college, I um, decided I wanted to start try to work in the entertainment business um, and to make movies. I didn't know what that meant in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I figured, you know, you start out answering somebody's phone and you start somewhere. And I figured I had a reasonable resume for a 20-year-old because I had had a whole career in radio. Uh, and so I moved here I moved to LA and I did in fact get a job answering somebody's phone and uh, over a little bit by little bit, I worked as a movie, a feature development executive for about 10 years. And then um, one day I was looking for a job and somebody called me and said, there's a, do a job at Disney Channel Original Movies. And I said, what's that? I didn't know what it was until, and then I realized, oh, I'd seen High School Musical because we love musicals. Uh, and I did a little bit of research because I do a lot of research and I realized that sounds exactly like what I wanted to do, even though I hadn't known that at the time. And now I've been at Disney 10 years. Um, okay, question though, Lauren. So we did take creative writing together for many classes during, in oh, high yes, school. Did. <laughs> did you ever think that you would want to write? Um, sure. I mean, I think I thought that at some point and you know what I ultimately love about my job I love many things about my job but it, in some ways I get to do like all the fun parts and not the hard parts is sort of my feeling you know I get to work really closely with amazing writers like Josh where we really spend a lot of the time doing the thinking part you know really getting inside of what does the character want and how does this world feel and 
um, you know, what are the themes and what does the friendship look like and all the sort of psychological, emotional stuff. And then Josh goes off to write it <laughs> and, and, and do the <laughs> and do the hard part of really figuring it out and making it right. funny and smart and beautiful and make sense and logical. Um, and then I get to go do the fun part. Sure <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that is easy. <laughs> but it's cyclical. If you and I and your amazing development staff at DCOM didn't do all of that work to begin with figuring everything out, writing would be darn near impossible. <laughs> so, no, seriously. It's uh, one of the reasons why I love working at Disney so much is that everybody there is real smart. Everybody there cares a lot about the structure of the script and the and the souls of the characters in the script and it's that kind of like energetic zazz that everybody has for the creation of stuff that makes it makes my job relatively easy as well we do hard work hard <laughs> in the abstract we're not building bridges <laughs> we are building emotional bridges <laughs> we are building emotional bridges and just to to Josh's point you know i, I do have just i i have I'm lucky to work with the most extraordinary people. And, um, you know, Charles Pugliese, who oversaw this movie in particular, it was just like the glue um, and, you know, was just a, a wonderful, beautiful partner that really helped put this all together. So that's a great point is the, the team is just a, an amazing part of it also. And for, okay, for those who are younger, I'm not sure what age is watching this, but I just want to explain a little bit about how this works. So I write, let's say I'm the novelist here. I write the novel. <laughs> And then you are you, you are the novelist. Are the the novelist. novelist. <laughs> then because I get questions all the time though, like are you are you making every day I get a question that says are you making the movie? So what happens is once I have the novel, I then sell or my agent um, sells the rights to make the movie to someone else, not me. So I, in this case, sold Upside Down Magic. I, I sold it with Lauren and Emily, and we sold it to Disney, um, and then Disney then takes all the rights of the movie and then decides what to do with it. No, I'm just going to explain because often I get questions like, why did you do that? Or why not this? Or will you be filming the movie? I think people imagine me with a camera acting out all the roles. I don't know. So then I, I would pay good money to see that version <laughs> of Upside Down Magic. I would Only like to say for the record. I would be an amazing Dritten. I have dragon wings. <laughs> yes, I would be. Um, so then after after Disney, we, we'll talk about the process in detail, but just for anyone watching who doesn't understand how it works, and then Lauren or the, the executives at Disney then hire screenwriters, directors, producers, and all the people to make the actual movie, and then they put it on television. So once I'm done with giving the right, signing the rights, I often don't, or any writer really often doesn't have anything to do with the movie. Sometimes the writers write the script as well, but that's unusual. And sometimes they get more involved, but that's much more unusual. Usually the author just sells it and then kind of waits to watch it on television or in the movie theater <laughs> or wherever that it is playing in the drive-in these days, I don't know. Um, a little bit about me. So I'm. Uh, so I became a writer. I grew up in Montreal. I took lots of creative writing classes with Lauren. Uh, shout out to Peggy if by any chance she's watching, because she was our favorite creative writing teacher. Uh, and then um, I went to McGill University. I studied English Lit, and I uh, just knew I wanted to write, but I thought I needed a job. So I I decided to get a job in publishing, and I moved to Toronto, and I worked for Harlequin Enterprises in their marketing department. Uh, and I had a lot of fun working there, but really, really wanted to write in Chiclet at, at the time, like Bridget Jones' Diary, Sex in the City, were the really popular genres, and I decided that I would try writing one of those. So I started writing, I wrote my first book, Milk Run, um, back in 2001. It's actually almost 20 years since that first book came out. Oh I my just, God! Yeah. <laughs> in December! 20 years, yeah, I can't believe it. Uh, and so I published that, and then I started to write more um, uh, YA. And I ended up moving to New to New York City, and I wrote there, and then I and then I started writing a little bit younger stuff. So that's kind of like the history of of how I got into publishing and writing. Um, so I thought we'd tell a little bit everyone about the process of how we got this specific movie project made. So it, I'll take us back. I, I believe it was 2014 um, when Emily, Lauren, and I uh, decided to write. Upside in Magic. We had already written a book together. The three of us, people always say, how do three people write a book together? We had actually written a book called How to Be Bad, which is a YA book. It's actually, it says Elockhart, not Emily Jenkins. 
E. Lockhart is Emily Jenkins, but she writes YA under E. Lockhart. Some of you may have read We Were Liars, which is like the hottest YA novel on the planet right now. So she wrote that. Um, and we had loved writing together. And we had dinner with David Levithan, who's an editor at Scholastic. He's also a writer. And we loved, loved working with him. And we brainstormed what we could do. And we ended up coming up with the concept for Upside Down Magic. And then the three of us started writing it. Uh, and we've, we've done seven books. We've done it in different ways. Sometimes the, the way we wrote most of the books is I'm in charge of the outline of the book. And then Lauren is in charge of the first draft and Emily is in charge of the revision, but we all come up with the concept of the book together. But that's like usually how we've done the bulk of the books. But this book we did a little differently with COVID and, and, and our schedules that we actually each did a certain amount of hours a day and would send the books, the, the manuscript back and forth. We all live in different places. Now I live in Los Angeles, Emily lives in Brooklyn, and uh, Lauren lives in uh, Colorado. So we've always written the books via email, writing back and forth, and we've never really been in the same spot to write anything together. Uh, so that's how we wrote this series. And then, but take us back to when the book came out, it was coming, came out in 2015, the first book, I think, uh, which is Upside Down Magic, which for those of you who don't know, is about a girl named Nori who goes to magic school and discovers that her magic is very wonky. I think that kind of covers both the movie and the book. So I'll say that. Yes. Most people in her world turn into kittens. She's a fluxer and she has fluxing magic, which means she can turn into animals. And while most fluxers turn into, say, kittens, her magic is a little wonky and she turns into a kitten with a little bit of dragon, so a dritten instead. And she turns into wonky animals. So uh, before the book came out, I believe I printed out the manuscript and Lauren was coming to New York City, and I had offered her to stay in my apartment while we were going to visit family. And she came to stay in our apartment. And she had optioned a few of my books by then. But th and this time, I just thought this was really a Disney movie. And so I printed out the manuscript and left it for her on the bed with a note, read this. <laughs> True. <laughs> Something like that. And that's my side of the story. <laughs> Lauren? <laughs> True. I mean, that, that is what happened. And, you know, Sarah and I had been friends for a really long time and, you know, our, our careers had taken slightly different paths at different times, but we always talked about Hollywood and how things worked. And I, you would always call me every time you were coming to LA and the, tell me who you were meeting. And I would tell you what I thought of them and what, sort of how, how it all worked. And then when I started working at Disney, suddenly we were working for the same audience and yeah. we had a couple of opportunities to work together and we had options some of your material and we're working on it, but you really knew from the beginning that this was for Disney and you were very clear and you let me know on your bed with the manuscript <laughs> and, um, no pressure. And, you, <laughs> and, and you were very generous in letting us stay at your apartment in New York, which was lovely with my two kids, my husband. <laughs> and, um, and you, we read the book and at first we, so at, at Disney channel, I have a really strange job where I make movies or I work on movies that, um, look like, uh, that, you know, act and feel creatively kind of like, like movies that you see in the theater, but it's a television network. And so our movies air alongside series. Um, and so we um, ended up feeling that the, the book for a number of reasons would make a really good series. Um, it felt like in about a group of kids at magic school, like what's better than that? Um, and, and the themes, you know, in terms of kids who are outsiders and whose powers did quite manifest in the way that other kids did. And so I shared it with some of my colleagues on the series team and they loved it and we, we optioned it and um, they tried to turn in development. So, as Sarah was explaining how the process works, you know, development takes a long time and trying, you know, even though the ingredients um, were always amazing, for whatever reasons, the scripts never quite um, came together. And um, at some point, you know, when, when somebody like Sarah, when an author sells their book to be adapted to a company like Disney, there's usually an amount of times, so I think it was 18 months or so, and we were coming towards the end and somebody said to me, hey, do you think this could be a movie? You know, maybe we should work on it before we lose our opportunity to work on the property. And I thought about it and I remember thinking, yes, for sure. You know, it has the, the fun, the, you know, we always think about sort of the building block, blocks or the ingredients in terms of what, um, what kinds of, pro what kinds of stuff is in the book, what kind of material. And, and sometimes you read a book and it's exactly a movie. You can see exactly how it works. And, and sometimes you look at the material, and in this case, and you realize that there's certain the ingredients are spectacular as they are in Upside Down Magic, 
but sometimes to make it into a movie, you may need to make a couple changes. Um, and, and in that case, we did, um, which we can talk about or we can get ahead of ourselves a little. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I mean, actually, I'm interested, like, what, when you're, when you're reading, like, what do you think, what makes a good adaptation in your mind? Like, what, what are the elements that you're looking for in a book? And Josh, I want to hear your, how you took this, but it seems like you can jump into this right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what, what is it that I look for in an adaptation? Is that the Oh, that I meant well, what is it that Lauren looks for, but then, but then oh. I'm curious, like, how you then executed that. All right, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you. Ha I actually think I, I. I don't know if you. I'd also love your answer because it's different, right? When you're looking at it from an executive lens, and when you're looking at it from a writer's lens, you're, I bet you we would have different answers to this question. So I would, you know, I'll share what I think, and then, because um, again, I'm I'm looking big picture at the pieces, and as sure. I said, Josh has to do the hard part, so he's right. looking much more specifically. Um, uh, you know, kids at a magic school, like in this case for us, we, we look for the concept, um, you know, we make movies for our, our demographic, you know, girls and kids, six to 14, six to 11. It's pretty narrow. We've made, I always forget the number. I should remember it off the top of my head. I think it's something like 115 Disney Channel original movies over the years. So, and I'm sure you have that experience too, Sarah, when you're talking to the same audience, it's a little hard not to find, not to repeat yourself. So you really right. look, you know, while, while there, there are certain themes that are always universal, we always say that everything we do is coming of age in some way. It's about discovering who you're going to be in the world, which is what all kids are going through at that age or all of us at all ages. Um, um, but, you know, the, what that, what the movie looks like, the bells and whistles, what that, you know, what it feels like should need to be different. Um, so we always look for telling a story that we think our audience will love, but in a slightly different way than we've seen before. Um, specificity is huge, right? How is this character and this story or this voice from an author's perspective just capturing something so specific that nobody else could say that? Um, and the other thing, the one other thing they look for, I always call it the sort of the forehead slapping moment, like the thing that you can't unthink, right? We, we're, my team, you know, we're, we're six, seven people who sit in a room thinking about what could we, what kind of movies can we make for, for kids? And we haven't thought of that idea before. Like, oh my God, like how could you not <laughs> see it? Um, so that's, we, that, that's kind of the recipe that, that we look for, but, but Josh would love to hear from a writer's perspective, you know, similar, different. Uh, well, I mean, Upside Down Magic is a lot like the Duff in that it's not a, it was a book and adaptation that was handed to me. Like I did not, uh, in that the Duff was something that McGee was producing and they brought in a bunch of writers to kind of give their takes on it. Uh, and Upside Down Magic was something that y'all had been developing for a while, and it was given to me and said, gently and kindly, do this as quickly <laughs> as you humanly can. Um, but so, like, I, I am currently in the process of adapting a book into a musical with the author, uh, which is something that I pushed for, even though it made my uh, my agent go, hey, but you get all the money. <laughs> Authors <It's>... are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say that, but it was just more like, well, then I have to split my fee with their agent. <laughs> uh, and I didn't care. Um, but so, and in that book, what jumped, one of the things that I look for is, is there a hook that I can personally engage with from sort of my limited experience as a, uh, as a boring human on this planet. Are there things from my life that I can read in the book and go, oh, I feel, I feel moderately to pretty comfortable thinking that there is stuff that I kind of have in my toolbox of feelings and emotions that means that I will be able to bring my POV to this, but at the same time, honor and celebrate uh, the work that the author did. You want to talk about the hard work. Writing a book is very hard work. It's so many pages. Screenplay, <laughs> 90 pages, 120 pages, tops. Unless you're like Paul Thomas Anderson and one of those weirdos. But like, <laughs> but books are like, have you seen them? They're like 300, 400 pages. It's crazy. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I want, so that, so basically I just want to be able to be like, oh, okay, I can, I can sell this story 
sell, not monetarily, but just sort of sell the idea to people of this story and my perspective on this story, while still putting the feelings and the emotions and the kind of ziz of the book uh, and port that over, uh, you know, uh, cinematically without messing it up too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, Upside Down Magic is very different from the book, and the duff is very different from the book. Uh, and in both of those cases, I would still like to think that the basic soul of the book and the soul of the characters remain intact. I believe it was Cody Keplinger, uh, who, uh, the writer of the duff, uh, the original novel, who told their uh, fans that uh, to think of it as a very elaborate fanfic. Uh, and, and that's, that's kind of great what way I, to put it. Yeah. It is a very elaborate, expensive fanfic. Uh, and I mean, especially when you look at Disney, Disney is very good at taking existing stories and properties and making them different from the original property, but still preserving that sort of glowing light at the heart of them. Uh, and, uh, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> No, I think that's absolutely true. Like, the, I feel at the heart, we all feel like this, like the heart of the book series is absolutely in the movie. Lots of things change. But like, for example, for people wondering, one of the biggest changes is that in, in our series, Nori goes to, she doesn't get, she applies to get into Sage Academy, the very fancy magic school, and does not get into Sage Academy, and instead is sent to live with her aunt to go to Dunwiddle Magic School, um, a, a public school that, her, that has a program for kids with upside down magic. And the school is not trying to get rid of the upside down magic, they're instead trying to help the kids, you know, live with it and um, really bloom with their upside down magic. So that is, a, that's very different, but the heart of it and the message of the movie and the book, I feel like, are the same. Um, so, like, one of the reasons people always ask us, well, why did they make those changes? And you guys could speak to them more, but my, my impression is that because you needed, our, our books are, like, cozy school stories, and to make a movie, you need a big cinematic story that is also has a big bad, but that is what I'm telling people. What, 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 what do you think? <laughs> well, it's also that, so one of the things that is fundamentally different between, especially the kind of series episode of Magic is where you want to make as many books as you possibly can, and it, the story goes on and on and on. Um, for us, the best way to get more than one movie is to make an amazing movie, not that it isn't with the book. So yeah. we need to do something that where it's sort of closed-ended storytelling, where there's really a beginning, med middle, and kind of a really finite end. And, and sort of the two things that we really needed to figure out for Upside Down Magic were one of the things we really know about this generation in particular of our audience is they really like to have, and, and it works very well for movie storytelling, a, a very positive impact on their environment. They like to change the world around them. And that means to, to do that, you have to have something about the world that needs changing in order for it to be satisfying that your protagonist changes it. And the other thing you have to have is stakes, which means what, what is at stake personally right. and for the world at large if they don't. And that's why you need the, the villain is sort of the externalization or the, the outside part of what happens if you don't change it. And right. for big movies like this, and we consider, you know, Upside Down Magic is a, is a big movie because it has a big world and very visual. And really, again, that goes to cinematic, you know, feels like a movie. And for us, it's really important that our movies look and feel different than the episodes, just so it's a different experience we can offer our audience. You know, again, it has to feel big. So what happens if she doesn't, what, if she doesn't learn the lesson of the movie or or solve the problem is that it's going to be the world as she knows, knows it may end, right? Shadow magic is pretty dangerous. So a lot of what we had to do, and then I w I'll kick it over to Josh, is really work backwards from that to really set up. And really, this is where Josh and, and Charles um, worked really closely. You know, we, we, we spend so much time working on rules, right? R really, really defining. Yeah. And Josh, you talk about it, but we just really working backwards to, est to establish again, what, what is the world? And it has to be, the world has to like look sort of reasonable at the beginning of the movie. So they, like you believe that like normal rational people would go to school there and send their kids to school there and sort of believe this to be true. Mm -hmm. And then yet to have something in it that's kind of wrong that Nori could go in and, and change. And I just want to say one other thing before turning it over to Josh, because 
I think the other, just to answer two of your questions, I think more than anything, what, what, what we fell in love with and what stays the same is, is Nori, right? That utter positive optimism and that, talk about the glowing heart of the soul of the movie is, you know, her, her she felt, and I think that's probably, Sarah, what you knew already and what struck me immediately. She's such a Disney character. She's such a Disney heroine with that belief in herself, even when the world tells her no and the impact of that belief on the world around her, that that was true no matter what but so, but to go back to josh to talk about stakes and world building and rules because that is what he gave us <laughs> so when when i when i came aboard on the project it very quickly became evident to me that there were and this was something that was backed up by everybody else uh there were a lot of good ideas there were a ton of them um there were two different scripts that we looked at. There's, of course, the series of books. There are all of the ideas that had been generated in the years of development before I came aboard. And so it became our job, me and Lauren and Charles, to sort of focus in on the best ideas we that could tell the clearest and cleanest story possible. Uh, and by the time I came aboard, there were already things added to it, like the shadow magic. And there were already things added to it, uh, like the Chandra character and, and things of that nature. Although I don't know if she was called Chandra at that point. Um, <laughs> and, we, and so it became this sort of whittling process. And along the way, we were like, all right, what are the ideas that we absolutely have to have? And we were all pretty adamant about the central story being the friendship between Reyna and Nori. Uh, and that is, that's something that I Reyna is have, new too, just for those watching. And Reyna, Reyna, and Reyna, Reyna is not, new, brand yeah. new. Um, <laughs> But we wanted, yeah, we wanted to, they wanted to make this a two-hander and they really wanted to make this about their friendship and what happens when one friend eclipses the other and that sort of thing. And that stuff is really, that's the stuff that I like to write about. That's the hook, if you will, that sort of brought me in and went, oh, I am always striving to be better at doing friendships and learning from other people's friendships. And I wanted to make sure that that was absolutely nailed in there. And then it became a process of like, okay, what else do we absolutely have to hang on to? We have to hang on to the dream. Nori had, and that is, that was like the first thing I was like, we're keeping the dream. We're like, okay, the dream stays. And then there were a lot of other things, like there was a long sort of protracted history of Sage and other times that shadow magic had attacked. There was a event that was going to be happening, but it wasn't exactly the way that we had it in the movie. There were other ancillary characters that popped up and different powers that popped up. And again, we just really wanted to make sure that the four kids, uh, plus their teacher, Scriff, uh, also new, I believe, um, it, we wanted to make sure that their powers, we wanted to make sure the powers were very clear, and then the upside down versions of the powers were very clear. Uh, we went through this the most with Elliot, if I remember correctly, uh, because it's like, well, what's the opposite of setting things on fire? And I believe in the books, it's, he's cold. Ice. He's got icicles. Yeah. Ice, yeah. ice, yes. Uh, and we were like, that's, it's not quite. Too expensive to produce. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> I was it going is. to say not as visually interesting <laughs> as other things, but yes, it was Too very expensive. expensive. Uh, smoke, on the other hand, I guess we got a group on for smoke CGI. <laughs> but, but I think in one of the drafts we were handed, and of course this is not meant as a, as a, a shade, it was just, I think, I think at one point he had uh, uh, pooting powers. Um, or that was a thing that I might have brought up. Uh, I brought up a lot of crazy things in the meetings. It's like, all right, well, okay, so for Andres, what's the opposite of, like, flying? And I was like, what if he tunnels underground like Bugs Bunny trying to go to the Coachella Carrot Festival? And they were like, you're fired. <laughs> and you're rehired because we really need this written. Uh, but we just, and again, it was just sort of clarifying the powers and then clarifying the upside down powers and then clarifying the history of shadow magic 
in the school and the way it presented and tying that into the reason why the upside down kids are kept in the basement because the idea is that the last guy who had shadow magic was upside down he also had the pooting powers so i'm glad that that's my first pooting joke in any of my screenplays by the way <laughs> uh and uh but we wanted to we just wanted to make that very clean and just like this kid had it so they think all upside down kids had it which is why they're in a basement until they stop being mad um, is this making sense? Yeah, I, totally. I have, totally. okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, but again, so it's just like paring down, and we had nothing but good ideas, we wanted to take the best ones, and then create as straight of a line from the beginning of the script to the end of the script, so it's a story that you can easily grasp from watching like the first five to ten minutes, which is I about all that we have for people to stay engaged and want to follow that journey through the end. No, I think that's awesome. And I think what's what's interesting for me as a novelist is understanding that a special effects have costs. <laughs> See, when we're writing novels, we're just trying to do something, things that are the most original, different, you know, a visually interesting in your brain, I guess, as possible. We don't even think about, oh, that would be expensive to produce because we're not making the movie. But of course that it has to be a fundamental issue for you guys. Fascinating. Um, awesome. Do we want to add anything or do we want to start taking questions? Because I know it's already like 540. The, the only one yeah. little thing I just want to add to what Josh was saying is that one thing that we really tried to hold on to um, as we were was as we were working backwards from understanding, you know, Nori changing the world and what that would mean and what would happen if she didn't is the notion that ultimately it's not about the upside down kids learning to be right side up, right? That that was not the end of this movie, that it was about the upside down um, kids learning to value and to change the perception of the world around them that the uh, that they that the def definition of what magic should be was too narrow and again so much of the work that Josh and Charles did was to really start from if you think what did they think magic was supposed to be and why in order to be able to to Josh's point about getting to the line in a straight way that ultimately the end of this movie isn't oh you can just be like us it's we need to change our definition of what you're supposed to be to be more inclusive and uh, I think that's good no go ahead sorry I just wasn't this, I think that's where where Sarah when we all came back to you and Lauren and Emily I think even though we were like so there's a rain a person and some shadow magic and like some really weird stuff and no more backs and no more sparky you know I think that's where when we all came back together and so does this feel like upside down magic your upside down magic yes. I think that's really what connected us all at the end of Absolutely. the day. Absolutely because that's the plot of the book too that's the message behind the books and the series is that Nor you know Nori at first even in the book one she wants to change her upside on magic so she can go back to stage academy and be a regular flexor similar to the movie and then she realizes that oh her magic is pretty awesome as it is she is magical even though her magic her differences make her special and that is amazing and she learns to accept it so we, i love that that was the theme and the plot of both the book and the movie yeah. she um, learns to accept it sage learns to accept it and it goes back to what lauren was saying about like we want to tell stories about kids changing the world around them and sage at the beginning of the movie is desperate to be changed it yeah. is a very it's a bad school it's a better school <laughs> now but it's a very bad they're putting kids in basements they're even that beginning part where it's like okay parents your kids are now going to walk through the woods with this strange man a lot of their methodology is <laughs> curious to me not to mention just like ensuring like that's a different conversation i was just thinking like after everything explodes it's like that's a lot of that's a lot of phone calls you have to make to parents that's neither here nor there but i i love the idea that not only does Nori accept her magic, but everybody at the school does, and at the end, Sage is a better place for it. Uh, and I think it teaches kids that the world will, if, you know, the world can be there for you. You do not have to change for the world. The yes. world will, the world will accept you or you will find the crowd of people who do accept you, and then together you can make awesome changes. And that's another thing that I love, the idea of this team coming together. I believe the first thing that Lauren told me was, do you want to do this? It's the breakfast club, only their magic. 
And I was like, yes, I will take, I will take that challenge. That sounds great. Well, that seems like a great place to pause and jump into some fan questions if you guys are up yeah, for that. Sure. Absolutely. Because they're coming in. So I want to yeah. make sure we get these answered. Okay. So um, somebody asked, can you talk about writing about Drittens and all the animals in the movies and books? Um, why, meaning why you want to write animals and which ones you put in? Um, well, I could start and then they could talk about which ones they decided to use and how they're different. But when we, uh, we, we came at it, we wanted to have five magic powers, types of powers. We had fluxers that can change into animals. We had fuzzies that can turn into animals, flares that have fire magic, flyers that fly. Um, and now I'm missing one. Did I say five or did I say four? You said you five. Said five. But... Oh, good. Flares. Okay. Did you okay. say five? Okay. Flyers? Flare? <laughs> Quicker, fire, right. And um, fizzies who can turn any water into lacroix. I would love to have them around. Movie two, movie two. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so when, when Nori turned into a kitten, we thought, well, let's do something fun. And, and Lauren Miracle had had a dream about the dragon kitten. And she told us about this. And we said, oh, that's perfect. We have to use it. So Nori turns into multiple different animals. Like she turns into a... Uh, um, a kitten goat and a puppy, a squid, a squippy. She turns into tons of different animals. The only, the difference in the rules between the movie and the books is her animals are only two. We never go into three, but you guys seem to all, you have many more than just two. So your world opened up a little bit. Yes, but we always, we kept kitten as the core one. Yeah. Uh, because they designed it and <laughs> they wanted to keep using it. Uh, <laughs> That and we, we spend a lot of time, again, in movies, there's a huge, you really look at both the creative and then the technical and the, can you actually make it? And we had so many, so many meetings about proportionality. I've never had the conversation about proportionality of, you know, there's just some very, like, very, very boring practical questions about, like, the shape of the legs and the head and is it going to be super weird? Um, but always wanted to have that kitten um, at its core and also have fun. They just were fun. We just want to see Dritten Halloween costumes for, for anybody watching. <laughs> Definitely dress up as a Dritten. My children have dressed up as a Dritten many times for many occasions. That sounds amazing. I would take um, an Octokitten costume as well. <laughs> as that one is the closest thing to being terrifying. It's true. Well, yeah. Kittens, oh, eight, 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 eight paws to kitten scratch you. Yikes. Um, okay. <laughs> More then questions. Aurelia wants to know, uh, who is your favorite character and what upside down power would you have as yourselves? Nori, upside down flexor, for sure. If I could be a Dritten, I would in a second. Who wouldn't? Um, well, in the, I would say, I, I would also, personality-wise, I'm very much Nori. But if I could take any upside down magic, I would take, well, oh, flickers. I didn't say that, actually, when I said the five Fs. So in the book series, there's flickers. And they have invisibility magic. So flickers in the movie can flick things, and but in the in, in the book series they can make themselves invisible or make other things invisible. And I would really much like to do that. Also a flyer. I, I kind of want multiple powers. We call that a double talent in the books if you have two. Josh. Oh, uh, I I mean my <laughs> favorite. I'm still dreaming about Acto Kitties. Yeah. I'm still. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My favorite characters to write in the movie uh, were Elliot, because Elliot and young Josh Kagan are almost interchangeable in many <laughs> ways, shapes, or forms, uh, except I did not blow smoke back then. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was, that was a blast to write. And then Pepper, Pepper is, I don't want to say my favorite character, but boy, oh boy, uh, the, the gal who played her, uh, made me laugh and laugh and laugh, and it's just great to have one character in a movie where everything is magic and light and, you know, mystical, to have one character who's just like, is this gonna take long? Like, she's just, Pepper's so over it uh, that I am, that, that, that she just delights me. She grows up to be a riot girl in my head canon. Uh, but, uh, and I would also like her uh, reverse movie flicker power to push things away because I think that would be very helpful for maintaining six feet of social distance, especially when people aren't wearing masks. 
Yes. Uh, yes. As a bookseller on the retail floor, I can tell you I would like that power as well. <laughs> <laughs> no yes. thanks. Yes. Um, and then Christina asks, how many movies will there be and when is the next one coming out? So we're jumping way ahead here. There's going to be 300 movies. Uh, <laughs> One Josh coming out. Them all. <laughs> one coming out every year. Yes, I have already uploaded my uh, soul to the mainframe, so it can continue to churn out UDM movies long past the heat death of the universe. Uh, Lauren, <laughs> you answered the question, Josh. Yep, three hundred. <laughs> a nice, a nice round birdemic number. Three hundred. Three million. Let's say three million movies. <laughs> I think we should ask the ca the audience uh, how many movies they want. Oh, that's a great question. That's a great idea. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. We'll see if answers to that come on in. Um, so, Sarah, uh, we saw that your family was able to visit the set. What was your favorite part? Somebody also asked, did you get to, get to visit the movie set and see the filming? And what was that like? So that's kind of a... So I that. did. I, I got to go twice, which was amazing because I've, I've written 40 books, but this is my first ever movie. So it was really a wild experience for me. So I went once with Emily and Lauren. The three of us got to go to Vancouver together. Not me. Oh, Arthur not other Lauren. Lauren. Sorry. Yeah, other Lauren, Lauren. Markle, not Lauren. Although I, I, I really did want you to come. I thought that could be really fun if we went together. <laughs> but um, I, I, it was just wild for us to see the set, to see all these things that, you know, Sage Academy we created in the in the first book and the, there it was and it was amazing and beautiful and kind of exactly how we imagined um and it was just it was, I, what i couldn't believe was how many people are involved in movies like there's there i feel like there were, i don't know how many people were on the set but it seemed like thousands <laughs> it was so many people everyone doing things and um you know the, there's food trucks and just people be there's so many people involved in this versus when you're writing a novel, usually it's just you by yourself. And then of course you send it to your editor, but it's a much smaller team than movies. Uh, and then I went back to, I got, I got to go with my husband and my two kids to see uh -huh. um, again. And that was really, really fun. Um, and it was amazing. And just, it, we, we, we saw the sets, which was, we saw the built sets. So the first time we went, we saw the school and the filming there, but the built sets was very different. Like just to see people, the way that the production team just built like the flare classroom out of nothing and there it was in Nori's bedroom and there were these amazing things and they made all, like, everything come to life. That to me is one of my favorite parts of writing stuff for film is the idea that you had the idea for these books like you I don't I mean maybe you were like walking around in your pajamas or you were drinking milk right out of the carton or watching something on TV. You had an idea in your head, you and your two co-writers, and then it becomes this thing. It becomes this physical thing that suddenly is on people's coffee tables and bedside tables and in people's backpacks. But then the idea that you had an idea, you had a thought in your head, and then suddenly there's a thousand million people and like sets and kids with the names of your characters. It's my favorite part of this. The idea that like, oh, I just thought a thing while I was minding my own business and just trying to like get my work done. And now all of these people took it very seriously, seriously enough. Yes. Yeah. Too, it's crazy. That's it. it's, People took it seriously and like made it happen is, is the wildest part of this whole experience. It's yeah, and the, the amount of people who are on set, it is amazing to me that any movie gets made because, and I haven't been on a ton of sets, I try not to ever leave the house. Uh, but like you go there and you see all this happening, and it's like, I hope this makes sense to somebody <laughs> because it looks like chaos. Uh, it's amazing. But it looks amazing when it comes out. It's so different. It was fa fabulous and fascinating to see the scenes that we had been there to film on the television afterwards. Oh, yeah. So how they did it and all the special effects. Well, watching the Dritten was was definitely the most amazing part because because you don't see the Dritten. You know, there's, there's no real Dritten. <laughs> I'm sorry for anyone who didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so this is, a, this is added and after, and that part was just amazing. Or watching, um, I think it was Andre's, like, on, you know, he was on or something for flying and then to see the way that it finally came out with him looking like he's flying was just really fun to see. All right so we've got a couple of people that want to oh. know about um, daily writing habits, oh. tips and tricks and how long it takes to write a book. 
Um, it depends. Uh, when you're also homeschooling, Zooming with your children, it takes a lot yeah. longer. Life is much slower these days. But um, I, I think the upside of magic books, because we work with three people, probably take us about six to seven months. And the process- I heard your Canadian accent. Yeah. So <laughs> <That's how> it, <laughs> it comes out sometimes. <laughs> Um, Every, I think that it, it, uh, it, it really depends the, uh, on the time. When I'm writing the whatever after books, that probably takes me about three to four months of like first draft, second draft and outlining. But the process gets stretched out because when I finish a draft, I send it to my editor. Then I wait a little bit for my editor to send us notes. Then we revise it. Then we send it back. So the same way that it takes a long time for a movie. Like the, this movie filmed last summer and just came out now. So it takes a long time for a, a movie to get made made um the same thing it just takes a long time for a book to come out yes, I'm sure, a lot of people don't yeah. know that about the book publishing process too yeah. how long it is yeah and for tips for writing for those of you who are writers uh, for uh, novels anyway i could say that um I always try to write the kind of book that you want to read. Like, don't try to be like, oh, this is really trendy. I want to write that right now. You know, romance is hot. I'm going to write a romance. If you're not into reading romance, you should write the kind of book you love so you're the audience. Um, and I would also say that to set it, I want some tricks I do. I never sit down to write a whole book. I always write in chunks. So I'll say, okay, today I'm writing a thousand words. Small, set small goals so then you could actually, you know, reach those goals. And you'll, if you write a thousand words a day, um, you know, in 30 days, you'll have a finished middle grade novel. Of course, you have to revise it and do everything, but just set small goals. And another thing that I do is I always outline everything before I write. So I don't just sit down. And different writers would tell you different things. Some people just sit down and like, oh, I'm going to write a book. And that's great for them. But I would write 100 pages, not know what comes next, and then have to throw it out. So I very much outline, which means like I write a blueprint of what happens in the book first, and then I write my first draft, and then I write, I revise, and then, then I, fi I finalize it. So I do lots and lots of edits and tweaks. And luckily, I also have amazing editors. I saw Amy Friedman pop on, who's my whatever after editor. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> awesome. We have a question for Lauren, actually, uh, which piggybacks a little bit off of what you were just saying, Sarah. It's how, generally, how long does it take from acquiring a project to seeing it up on the big screen or a screen, as the case may be? Um, Medium-sized screen <laughs> yes, for us. A screen of some sort. Um, and then is it a longer amount of time or shorter amount of time at Disney? And how many projects or movies you're working on at once? Ooh, those are lots of questions. Um, yes. Such great questions. It, it so can depend. You know, I, I always say like, you know, when people are winning Oscars and they're like thanking their agents for like the 20 years it took to get the movie made. Sometimes <laughs> it, in fact, that happens, right? Like there are certain things that it's it just, you're trying and finding it. Um, and it, it can take you a long time. You know, again, for us, we have such a strange job because we make movies, but it's at a network and a television business and the TV business moves. Like it's very concrete. You know, when we buy a piece of material or a script or even very early on the process, we start talking about, okay, well, if we shoot this in 18 months and if we shoot it next year or this summer. So we, we get very, very pragmatic and practical very quickly about how it could fit into our programming strategy. Does it make a good summer movie? So you know, there's definitely exceptions in Upside Down Magic. Again, it took a little bit of time to figure out, you know, again, we spent quite a bit of time trying to um, develop it as a series. But once we identified it as a movie, it, it moved pretty quickly. So I would say if you, you know, wake up one day and say, I want to make a movie about a singing zombie, because we have a zombies franchise, um, you know, to the time you're ready, you know, if you, if you have a year, even like if you have a year or somewhere between a year or two from like that beginning idea to be ready to say, I think we should make this movie, you are like super ahead of the game. Like a year to 18 months is like really, really genius. And then um, when you're working with Josh, that's usually what happens. And then, um, you know, then you have to film it. Oh, then you have to prepare to film it, which sometimes the prep, you know, it's, it's really funny hearing Josh and Sarah get very excited about like what it all looks like. That is work. I mean, we spend <laughs> days and days and I mean, we had conversations about what should the trash cans at Sage Academy look like? No joke. Wow. Um, and do they carry backpacks or is it the kind of school, do they have water bottles? Do they carry, do they have lockers? They don't, you know, we have lots and lots, you know, the whole notion of the colors that the wardrobe, a huge thing. So that's the planning takes the time and then the shooting and then the finishing of the movie, the music, the editing, the, the visual effects, if it's a visual effects heavy movie. Um, so it, for us, again, we have a pretty abbreviated time frame. usually from when you go to camera to when it airs on your television, again, 
a year. Sometimes we can squeeze it a little bit um, if we really work very hard. And um, uh, but that's usually about so a, you know a year to write the script, a year and a half to write the script, and then a year to make the movie. You are super ahead of the game. You are not standing up and thanking somebody for sixteen years of work. It's like two years. And right, right. So how many projects are you working on at once, Lauren? Ooh. And I would um, well, ask the so same I, of Sarah and Josh too afterwards. I mean, again, I have a whole team. I have a wonderful team of five executives. So we have a whole bunch, um, you know, and we, uh, so probably it's 20, 30, and it kind of ebbs and flows. It sort of depends um, in terms of development projects, 20 to 30 sometimes. Um, you know, right now we have two movies prepping, two others casting, and um, many more that, you know, a bunch of others that we're, we're looking to produce um, behind that. So in terms of shooting, it could be a lot. Yeah. Uh, I currently have, uh, actually, before I say that, I just want to say one of, one of the other reasons why I love working at Disney is uh, I come from the features world. And for the two movies that came out uh, theatrically, back when there were movie theaters, uh, we each one took about five years from me selling the screenplay to the movie getting made. Like, set your watch by it. Takes about five years for a movie to get made. What I immediately really loved about Disney is that, like Lauren said, they are adhering to a schedule and they are motivated to make content. Uh, and that works for me. I, uh, I'm a big fan of sort of the 50s and 60s era of movie making, where it's just like, our movies are better. I had once said to Lauren, I was like, this is so great. It's like working for Roger Corman. And she was like, our movies, <laughs> our movies are better, Josh. And I was like, yes, the movies are better, but we're still hustling to get stuff out. We're not resting on our laurels. Like we made a movie, check back in five years. Uh, and so I just, that's one of the things that I love most about working with Disney. Uh, what was the other part? How many things are you working on at once? Three. I am currently working on three. I'm working on, uh, I can't, I can say spin. Uh, and then I'm working on this. I'm doing rewrites for spin. I'm sure. Do it tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday morning. Um, <laughs> I'm negotiating with Lauren quietly and subliminally. <laughs> uh, uh, and so working on spin, working on this unnamed adaptation with unnamed author, and then unnamed movie project that may or may not be related to a project that may or may not exist. Well, if that's not specific, then I don't know. Wink. What I, <laughs> wink. All right. Um, okay, so I think that you will all enjoy, you three lovely contributors and then our, our fans as well, um, hearing the answers to how many movies people think that you should make. So, totally. you know, Lauren, I think you need to take some notes, um, and I think you all need to get writing because it ranges, let's see, we have, I have to count zeros on this, one million, <laughs> five, um, oh my gosh, one, two, three, three, I think this is 30 trillion, <laughs> five. Or it could be terabytes. They may it want could five, be, yeah, it's, 30 it's, terabytes it's kind of, of movies. We've gone beyond the human labor. A lot of zeros. Yeah, yeah. A lot of zeros. Uh, 1,500, 30,000, five. 18 million, okay, maybe 10, uh, 10, the whole series. Yeah. I yeah. like the people who did five and 10 because they're like, hey, <laughs> let's be reasonable. <laughs> let's Everybody's people, yeah. throwing around crazy numbers. While I don't think that's going to work. True. While you're all waiting for potential sequels and stuff, remember that there are now seven books in the Upside Down Magic series that you can read right now. You can yep. order them from Anderson's and they will yes. send you the books. You can make, do curbside pickup. I don't know what you guys we are. absolutely do. We are shipping. Our st two stores are open with masks and we can ship them to you or come in for curbside. Amazing. And even if, say, you don't want to buy one of the Upside Down Magic books, please support uh, your local bookstore and buy a book from it, from them, Anderson's anyway. Even if it's not Upside Down Magic, they, they definitely need you to come buy them. So please do. Um, and the other thing that we're working on is book eight. At, we're right, the, we are currently revising Night Owl, which is the next book in the Upside Down Magic series. We just started revising it today. We got notes back from our editor a few days ago, and we are really working hard to make it amazing, and it'll be coming out, I believe, next summer. And, oh, and for those of you who want to read, who haven't read Upside Down Magic, we even have a box set, which yes. just came out, like three, three, maybe 
three months ago, and it is adorable. It has the first five books in the series. And for people who want to see the, the movie, um, can you guys, could, Lauren, could you know, or can you tell us where, when it's going to be on next on the channel? Do you happen to- I'm going to be projecting it on the side of my building sometime this week. Amazing. So just come, just come by. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly yeah, when we're going to be <laughs> because I should have known that, but we do air it a lot. It's definitely on Disney now. Um, yeah. And I'm sure it will be on Disney channel again very soon. Yes. And, I want to can pull that up. <laughs> and you can and you can purchase it uh, for uh, with American dollars or international uh, coinage, whatever you happen to have rattling around in your pocket on like Apple and Amazon yeah. and I maybe Voodoo. I don't know. It, <laughs> I don't know if people use that. Uh, and uh, it should be on one of the million dollar questions we've all gotten is, but Josh, what about Disney Plus? They didn't call uh, Lauren and Sarah Josh. <laughs> Uh, but uh, and and we can say first quarter uh, 2021. It, so, yes, it will be on Disney Plus, just not quite yet. First, it's on yes. Disney Channel. Oh, okay. I found it here. There, it's a it's September 7th and October 25th. It'll definitely be on those dates. So on Disney Channel. Oh, yeah, on Disney, Disney Channel. Channel. Yes. Okay. Thank so you, Sarah, for knowing that better no than problem. me. No <laughs> problem. I found the email. <laughs> it looked good. What is he? No, like no, that? I, it might. I, I mean, it might be other times too, but yes, you can find it on the ch the channel. I think they're doing a big Halloween encore, so that should be really fun. Again, I recommend Dritten Halloween costumes for everyone. <laughs> so actually, um, we have a fan here who wants Dritten merch. So oh. I think you all need to get working on that. And if you can have it in time for Halloween, then the costume is even easier, right? <laughs> true oh fantastic all right well um uh, montreal is very proud of you just so you guys Aww. know um, thank you <laughs> definitely seen the show on disney now um and josh beth says she's going to show up to watch the movie on the side of your building so Great. um i think we're all set for our week plans i, I mean if you're <laughs> sounds like everybody's get, we're doing well um do you guys have anything else you want to you want to wrap up with I just thought that you just uh, mentioned the audiobooks, and there are audiobooks, and they're fantastic. So if anybody wants to listen to the books, you can buy them right through you guys, right? Yes, at Libro.fm. Actually, it's, uh, there's a link on our website, or you can go to Libro.fm, and that is audiobooks that support independent bookstores. So we'd love if you did that. Amazing. Thank That's you. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, what Thank a treat you. to get to, to <laughs> see people and, and get to talk about this super fun process. Yes. 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 Thank, you. Thank you very much, everyone. This was delightful. Yeah, thanks for Thank coming. you, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate it. As we've mentioned a couple times, Anderson's is your local independent bookstore. Um, so in, in normal times, we are doing 400 events a year for all ages, all interests. And um, now that it's in uh, pandemic times, we are doing our best to try and keep everybody connected this way. So thank you for attending. Thank you for supporting us. It really does matter. It's very personal. We're going on five generations of the Anderson family, excuse me, six generations of the Anderson family owning and running the store. So um, we are very excited to uh, put books in your hands any way so thank you josh lauren and sarah for your time everybody else for joining us now go right to bed kids you probably have school tomorrow and uh everybody happy reading be well thank you so much thank Yay. you everybody we did it <laughs>